Hi everyone, this is Jen from Brit Mums, and I'm here today with Hannah Rosen, and we are talking about her new book, The End of Men. So, Hannah, welcome. So Hi. glad you had time to talk with us. Oh, I'm delighted to. Um, so, The End of Men discusses the decline of modern man in areas like money, education, employment, power, and the rise of women in those areas. Um, what is that? actually mean for women? Uh, it means all sorts of things. It kind of depends where you are in society. If you're, you know, and let's say you're a lawyer and you're trying to get ahead and you work in a male-dominated law firm or something like that, um, then there's a separate chapter in there for you which explains kind of what are the stereotypes working against women, kind of what are the ways in which women get in each other's way, that kind of thing. For the broad swath of society, what it basically means is I'm trying to get women to think differently about how we normally think about the relationship between men and women. So I started out with an economic argument. You know, women were rising fast in this economy. They were seemed to be adapting better to the changes that were happening in this economy. And you've got a whole bunch of new breadwinner wives, so women who are supporting their families. Um, and the most important thing that women are graduating from school at much higher rates and we live in a world in which that's now a prerequisite to a middle class life. So those are the sort of broad, broad trends, but as time went on, uh, this started as an article in 2010, as time went on I started to think about it more in terms of relationships between men and women. Uh, I started to talk to a lot of couples, you know, what was it like if your wife earns more money than you do? Or, you know, to look at sort of slices of life where people were living in totally new ways and where there was basically a lot of social upheaval. And so it means a lot for women kind of both in their personal relationships, in their workplaces, and then, you know, the final thing is in how they raise their children. I have a daughter and two sons, and since you guys are Brit moms, you, I can assume you all have children. Um, and so I think a lot about that element as well. You know, what, what, what does this mean for the world that my daughter and sons are going to enter into? I can't hear you. Sorry, one thing um, I was thinking about was how there's still a lot of uh, male dominance at the top of certain areas that are really important, mm -hmm. finance, business, government. So is it premature, giving, given that the importance of those areas, is it premature to say that it's the end of men in that area? Or yeah, I mean, I guess it depends how literally you take the term end of men. Like, you can think about it as the end of the assumption of patriarchal privilege. Like, we no longer assume that men are destined to rule. You know, I live in Washington, D.C., um, so, you know, I'm not blind. I understand <laughs> we haven't even had a female president yet, so there is certainly a long way to go. The way I look at that women at the top question, first of all, I just want to say, like, while the top is very important, there's a huge amount of social upheaval in lots of other places. Um, secondly, uh, I look at the top and think, this has only been going on for 40 years. Like, it hasn't been going on for that long, the rise of women. It was not even that long ago that women didn't even work. So there's been a tremendous amount of change happened in a very short time. So then we have to think to ourselves, well, what's happening right now? Like, right now, if you're a 25-year-old woman and I'm showing you the sweep of history, you know, you're going to be like, okay, sweep of history, but what about me right now in my office? What does this mean for me? And so I address that pretty specifically in the book, kind of, why is it that we as a society are still kind of uncomfortable around female power, that even though we've got a lot more role models, I mean, we've had sort of dreams of Secretary of States now, we've at least had a woman running for president in the U.S., um, Christine Lagarde, who's the head of the IMF, like, we have these role models out there, but we need a lot more of them. Uh, and so I talk about kind of how do we get to the next step, what are the barriers now both inside ourselves, and a lot of them have to do with parenting, as you guys know, you discuss this all the time, kind of the difficulty of you know, uh, flexible work, childcare, and getting to the, it, it, it's pretty straightforward what the last barriers are. I mean, when I think about some place like the UK, one heartening thing is, 
Um, well, in Europe in general, I will say one heartening thing is that people, women aren't having children. It's almost like your continental protest <laughs> against the inability of workplaces to, you know, to bend to your ambition. And in fact, it's it's a good revenge because the European governments are now really, you know, freaked out about that. And so it, the UK is now taking a great step, which is not just talking about maternity leave because we in the US are like ages behind you. We don't even have maternity leave, but thinking about parental leave and kind of childcare in general, which is gender neutral and which I, which is I think the place that we all need to go to because the younger generation of men people always tell me have the same desires for their workplace as like me a 42 year old woman they do not think like their fathers did they would like to be at their desks all day they would like to work all the time you know the vast majority of young young men would like to have some flexibility built into their life too either because it's out of a sense of entitlement or laziness or who knows what they just don't want to dedicate their lives to work in that same way so I think you know I think you can see where the movement is going to happen you mentioned the UK. Uh, the book features a lot of um, examples, facts, figures from America. Um, is it the same here in the UK in terms of these transitions you're seeing? Um, in every country, I have a chapter on Korea where I talk a little bit about the international scene. There is a version of this phenomenon happening pretty much all over the world. It just happens differently in different countries. So what's different here? I think for one thing, the UK has um, made peace with the waning of the manufacturing era. In the US, we're still really working that out not merely as an economic question, but when our politicians talk about the manufacturing era, that's a proxy for a conversation about manhood and sort of where is American manhood, you know? I think that conversation happens here the way it does there. That sense of men from all levels of society that you know, there are different expectations on fathers, there are different ways to be a man, but men just kind of aren't sure they want to go to that, you know, post end of men place quite yet. Some of them go to it willingly, some of them are just not sure, is it okay? Is it emasculating to, to sort of stay home with your children a day or two a week? Is that okay? You know, we, you guys discuss the problem, you know, the penalty that women pay for, for you know, asking the workplace for some flexibility around their children, but men pay an even bigger price. I mean, there's still a way in which we have have an accepted kind of paternal responsibility. So I think men are confused on both uh, on both continents. Um, and you know there are a few other differences. Like here, you you tend to think in terms of quotas, and we don't think in terms of quotas. So I think I think they're both valid ways of approaching the issue. But but I but I really admire the discussion that many Europeans countries have and there are different stages of this conversation about you know do we just solve this problem by putting more women on corporate boards or by you know forcing certain kinds of child policies I think that's really interesting and I'm looking forward to that experiment in Sweden they're sort of furthest along in the kind of forced young paternity experiment and it's actually quite amazing I mean they've really created a culture of domesticated masculinity, which is really interesting. Um, in Norway, they're further along on the women in corporate boards experiment, you know, where they sort of forced 40% of certain companies to have women. And we have seen women make different decisions uh, during the recession in the boards that have more women on them. So I, I, you know, I love that the Europeans kind of force the issue more than we do. Um, I love that idea of um, domesticated manhood and kind of that it doesn't have to be, you know, Fe feminization, really. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I did um, almost after reporting this book was look at the history of the American sitcom, and I looked at 50 years of sitcoms, and one thing I was just amazed to find is that whenever you put a man, almost whenever you put a man in a domestic scene, he's an idiot. Like, he messes everything up, he you know, drops things on the floor, he gives terrible advice to his children. It's like Homer Simpson, sort of starting in the 50s and up to now. But there was actually a hopeful end to this story because I feel like just this year, just now, are we getting a few role models on TV and in the movies of men who are, you know, got the baby Bjorn strapped on, hanging out with their friends, taking care of the kids, in one case a full-time stay-at-home dad on an American sitcom, who's not just a competent father, which is step one, but also still sexy, like th th still attractive to his wife, and I think that's the important thing. Like this, these guys still have some sex appeal. They're still really fun. Their wives want to sleep with them. That's really important. <laughs> um, so you don't see uh, you don't see the mere act of child care child caretaking as in, you know in immediately emasculating. Do you think on a domestic level that the rise of women may change that dynamic that 
so many women experience where they're working full time, their husband's working full time, but when they get home, they're doing the cooking, they're doing the washing, they're doing the second shift and putting the kids to bed, and it's still primarily their responsibility. Yeah, I described this phenomenon comes up in several places in my book, uh, both in a large uh, survey that I did. I did a survey of women who earn a lot more money than their husbands, uh, or who earn more money than their husbands, and even in cases where the women earn a lot more money, like multi-million dollar real estate lawyers, they never relinquish the domestic sphere. In other words, I rarely come across a woman who says, oh, that's his. And I remember one stay-at-home dad, he was a professor who didn't get tenure, so he was doing part-time work, and he was largely home taking care of the kids, and he described his wife to me as a domineering absentee boss, you know, who would just sort of text him and call him all the time and tell him what to do, even though he was the one home with the kids. So I actually, um, that you know, have a personal moment in the book where I needed to finish a chapter which was precisely about women at the top and the barriers. And my chapter was due, and we were going away on vacation. And so my husband, so I, 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 st I skipped out of the vacation, which is the first time I've ever done that. And my husband was taking the kids, we have three children, um, 11, 9, and 4. He was taking the kids on his own, sort of with his brother, to this vacation house. And as I was watching him pack, the whole time in my head I was thinking, he's doing this wrong, he's packing the wrong thing, he's taking the wrong shoes, he's taking the wrong books. And I just shut my mouth because I knew, you know, I'd been, I was writing this very chapter at the time that he was leaving. So, you know, again, I'm reluctant to say, oh, because it's just the men are lazy slobs. I mean, I'm sure it's like the men don't step up maybe the way we want them to, but th these are sort of old grooves. It's also because the women insist that the tasks be done in a very particular way. I and mean, there's one couple in my book, and people have been very critical of the guy in the couple um, because he didn't clean the diapers. He, like, left the mess in the diapers for her to deal with when she got home. On the other hand, she was insisting on using cloth diapers. So I feel like, you know, you either let go of the control or you don't let go of the control. So so I think there, you know, we have to examine these relationships on all sides and not just say, like, oh, that's just the way it is. You know, it doesn't have to be that way. Fantastic. So what's next for you now after the end of men? I need to sleep. I need to spend some time with my children. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this book tour has been sort of the longest I've ever been away. Um, so, no, seriously, I need to spend, like, I can't even, you know, I need sort of two or three weeks to just, like, hang out. I feel like, I know I can say this because we're on Brit Moms, literally my fantasies involved hey, picking up my children from school. I realize that's embarrassing, but I miss them, and I've been away a lot. And so, um, and so you know, here I am thousands of miles away. So I, I need to just, like, take it easy. And it's funny, I write in the book about this phenomenon of seesaw marriages that for you know sort of non-college educated people marriage is falling apart but for the college educated these days marriage is quite strong because men and women do a lot more sharing so you know uh, you know the Obamas have a seesaw marriage where she's a healthcare executive and he was working in public service and then they switch places and um, my husband and I have that pretty strongly right now because I've been on book tour and like honestly the spotlight's been mine I've been working on a book I've been working really hard I've sent him on vacation he's the editor of a magazine he works but um, but it's it's kind of his turn too <laughs> so I need to I think step back a little bit for the next few months figure out what I want to do next I mean go back to my old jobs and, and just take it easy for a couple of months <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you for finding time to come chat with us at Brit Mums. Uh, we do hope we'll see you over on this side of the pond uh, more. And um, that was Hannah Rosen. Thanks. And you guys are doing great work, so keep it up. <laughs> Thanks.